Hi, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is Balu here. Uh, we want to discuss uh, on uh, part three of uh, requirement engineering process, and uh, the session we are going to do now is called as requirement types. I'll quickly take you through the session objectives. So we're going to talk on uh, the different type of requirements, and uh, we are also going to see viewpoint of requirements. Then later on, uh, we shall uh, deep dive into the requirements uh, discovery. Then we shall also see social and organizational factors which affect the requirements. It's also called as ethnography. Then we will have a uh, brief introduction to system context. And uh, finally, we'll close the session by understanding what is a process model and a data flow. Now, we know what requirement is. I have defined this in my previous session as well. A requirement is nothing but uh, the expectations are given by the customer. Now, these requirements fall under many types. Okay, now uh, already we have seen two types. One is called as an enduring requirements and second one is called volatile requirements. Apart from that, uh, it also falls into many types. They are called as functional requirements, non-functional requirements, domain requirements, user requirements and system requirements. Now, all these requirements uh, put together becomes your software requirement specification document. Now, first we shall say what do you mean by a functional requirement. Now, in order to understand the functional requirement, we have taken an example of an ATM machine. I hope everybody would have used the ATM machine uh, uh, in one way or the other. Now, what are the functional requirements of an ATM? Now, before we understand the functional requirements of an ATM, first we shall define what a functional requirement is. So, as you can see here, they are the statement of services what the system must provide. So, it basically describes system functions in detail. Uh, what are the various inputs and outputs and what are the expectations and so on. Now, for example, if you take any ATM, it should have a facility where you can insert an ATM card. It should have a facility where it has to validate the card. The moment you insert the ATM card, it should check whether the card is a valid card or an invalid card. Then it should prompt you for a PIN number. Then it should basically validate the PIN, whether your PIN number entered is correct or wrong. Then it should display certain options like what do you want to do with this uh, particular session, whether you want to select an SB account or a current account. Then it will ask about whether you want to withdraw money. Then if you want to withdraw money, then it is going to dispense the cash. Then it is going to print the transaction slip. Or if there is some error which has occurred, whether you don't have an ins insufficient balance, or if it is not able to actually dispense the cash due to uh, some of the problems internally, then it is supposed to display an error message. Now, these are called as functional requirements. So, you need to have these kinds of uh, requirements in order to ensure that ATM works in its more proper form. Now, uh, apart from functional requirements, you also need to have non-functional requirements. So, as you can see, uh, non-functional requirements are contrary to functional requirements. Now, they basically define the constraints on the system, then they are more critical than the functional requirements. Now, what do you mean by constraints on the system? They are used to judge the operation of the system. Now, when you mean operation, uh, we actually talk in terms of security, we actually talk in terms of storage, we say how secure your ATM machine is. Okay, and if your ATM machine is not at all secure, then what is the point in having such an ATM machine? Even though your all functional requirements are well set and well defined, if your ATM machine is not secure, then the ATM machine is just a scrap box. Similarly, it talks, we talk about the storage requirement, we talk, we talk about the configuration requirement. But more importantly, we talk about the performance requirement. How fast your ATM machine can respond to the user? Okay, the moment I insert a debit card in my ATM, how fast it will respond to me? If it takes longer time to respond or it is taking lesser time to respond. Now, we, talk, we also talk in terms of cost, we talk in terms of flexibility, we also talk in terms of disaster recovery, very important. In case if the, in case if the machine crashes due to what, whatsoever reason it could be, then what will happen to my data? how fast I can recover my data back. Now, all these are called as non-functional requirements. Now, there is another requirement type called as a domain uh, requirement. And now, first understand what do you mean by domain. Domain basically means area of expertise. Now, 
after you finish your college and when you enter into a software development company then uh, people will generally ask you in which domain you are working okay you can say that i work for an insurance domain you know some people say that i work for a banking domain or you know some may say that i work on a crm that is customer relationship management domain so that is basically an area of expertise for example now there is a domain called e-commerce now what is how do you define a domain domain requirements reflect the environment in which the system operates now i am talking about atm machine now that means we are actually focused on a banking domain because the entire atm focuses on a banking domain so any requirements which comes from the banking domain are called as domain requirements now that could be in terms of certain banking rules certain banking policies uh, etc so they all come come under your domain requirements now you have uh, user requirements actually the user requirements is basically the combination of both functional requirements and non functional requirements and please ensure that there is no use of technical jargons in your user requirements that means user requirements has to be written in pure natural language now you cannot use technical jargons because the user requirements are actually it is written for a end user if you start putting technical jargons in a user requirement the user will not be able to understand what exactly those technical jargons are now what do you mean by jargons some technical words which are only understood by software engineers and development team but it is not understood by a user for example you put a jargon like i am going to use a tcp ip protocol for my network now the user doesn't even know what a tcp ip protocol is so that means you have to ensure that whatever information you give in the user requirement it has to be documented properly in a layman's language which means avoid use of technical jargons now the output of this uh, user requirement is called as a user requirement document which is very popularly called as an URD now we enter into the another set of uh, requirements and they are called as system requirements now what is a system requirements it gives the detailed description of the system and its services and please know that this system requirement is an enhanced version of user requirement now whatever you have given in the user requirements i expand it i add it i add more detail to that user requirements and come out with something called as system requirement and this system requirement is actually used for designing the system or it is used as an input for designing the system it has to be complete it has to be consistent it should not have any ambiguities and it should also basically tell me the specification of the whole system what means what that system will provide to the customer after it has been implemented therefore sometimes we use that system requirements as a contract between the customer who is actually giving the requirement and the person who is actually developing a software deliverable in compliance to that particular requirement now during the requirements uh, discovery process uh, we have a concept called viewpoint now viewpoints are very important now before we understand what exactly is a viewpoint in terms of a requirement perspective we shall now understand what a viewpoint in a layman's perspective now what do you mean by a viewpoint now all of us would have encountered uh, problems in our day to day life let's say that we have a problem on hand and we want to tackle the problem and there are three people who want to tackle the problem now my perception of tackling the problem would be different from your perspective perception i mean that means the way i tackle the problem would be very different from the way you tackle the problem or the way i look at the problem would be totally different from the way you look at the problem that is exactly what i mean by a viewpoint now what is a viewpoint it's a way of organizing the requirements for a soft software system based on some perspective such as an end user perspective or a manager's perspective now whenever you look at an requirement you look at from the end user's perspective and you also look at the manager's perspective and see what are their viewpoints on that particular requirement now these viewpoints are of three types we call them as interactor viewpoints indirect uh, viewpoints and finally we have another viewpoint called as a domain viewpoints now first we shall see what do you mean by an uh, uh, interactor viewpoint and later on we shall see what are the other two viewpoints 
Now in the interactor viewpoints, as you can see here, as the name itself suggests interactor, interactor means they directly interact with the system. Now there are two uh, uh, entities who are involved here. One is an entity called as a customer or an end user. The another entity is called as a system. Now here the end user interacts with the system and the system also interacts, the subsystem also interacts with the system. Now for example here the customer will actually use an ATM for you know basically withdrawing cash. Once the cash has been withdrawn the balance has to be updated into the database. So ATM interacts with the database. Now if the customer wants to withdraw cash the ATM should find out whether there is sufficient balance or not. So it will check the database, database will give the balance of the customer and then that particular account will be validated. So this that means both the customer and the system are directly interacting with this particular ATM. So we call them as interactor viewpoints. Now there are uh, indirect viewpoints, for example management and staff of the bank, they may not directly interact with the ATM but they influence certain system requirements, they are called as indirect viewpoints. Now one such example could be security. Now what do you mean by uh, security and how does that influence the uh, indirect uh, viewpoint is, now let's say that you go into an ATM machine and you are trying to uh, withdraw the cash and there is a stranger who is standing behind you who is trying to who is trying to rob you or who is going to, uh, you feel that, uh, you sense that he is trying to, you know, basically uh, make some trouble to you or going to cause some personal damage to you. So in that case, there are certain panic buttons which are available in the ATM. The moment you press that particular panic button, then what exactly happens is it will directly call and inform the police. So that is called as an indirect viewpoint. So management and staff have got certain influence on that particular system. Then you have uh, domain viewpoints. I told you what a domain is. Domain basically means the area of uh, expertise. So in this case since we are talking about an ATM machine the domain would be a banking uh, domain. So what could be a domain viewpoint? They have certain banking rules and regulation. Now for example uh, you are using an ATM. Your maximum withdrawal in an ATM is 25,000 rupees per day. Now if you cannot, if you want to draw cash more than 25,000 rupees, the ATM may not allow you. Why it is not allowing you? Because it is not the constraint on the ATM. It is basically the rules dictated by the Reserve Bank of India. Therefore it becomes a domain requirement. Or for example, you are using an ATM machine to deposit a cash. Okay, it's called as a cash deposit machine. Now if you are depositing cash more than 50,000 rupees, you have to provide with the PAN number. So in that case it is a domain viewpoint because the banking standard says that any cash deposited in an CDM above 15,000 rupees, 50,000 rupees I mean requires a PAN number. So these are called as viewpoints which comes under your requirements discovery. Now here there is an example of a library management system where all viewpoints are discussed on the top. Now you can see that all VPs means all viewpoints and there are three sections of viewpoints here. You have an indirect viewpoint, you have an interactor viewpoint and your domain viewpoint. Now you can see an indirect viewpoint you have the manager, finance and article providers. They are the people who are directly interacting with the system, with system, library management system and uh, interactors are users and library staff. Sorry, I just uh, mistook here. Indirect viewpoints are the people who are indirectly in interacting with the system, they are library managers finance and article providers. Interactors are those who actually involve directly. For example, they are users and library staff and users can be further classified as students, staff and external users. Similarly, library staff can further be classified as uh, system managers and catalogers. Then you have domain uh, uh, viewpoint which will have UI standards and classification system. So like this we can basically organize uh, the uh, requirements uh, into multiple branches or group them into multiple branches depending upon whether they are indirect viewpoints or interactive viewpoints or domain viewpoints. Doing this way requirement elicitation becomes very very easier. Now how do you uh, actually get the requirements? Now you understood that every system needs a requirement. You understood that stakeholders gives us the requirement. You understood that requirements can be categorized into viewpoints. But ultimately the question is how do you get the requirement? Now 
you know that stakeholder gives a requirement but how do we get them if you want to get a requirement from a stakeholder you have to go and talk to a stakeholder and interview him okay and there are different types of uh, interviews we shall see one by one and see what are the various methods of conducting those interviews now the process of discovering the requirements from a stakeholder is actually called as an requirements discovery and one such way of doing that is called as an interview and there are two types of interviews one is called as an open interview and the second one is called as a closed interview now we shall see what an open interview is in an open interview you directly go and talk to the uh, stakeholder and ask him what are his pain areas now he is going to tell you the current situation and he is also going to tell me what is going to be the future situation now you know if you want to go from current situation to future situation what are the objectives and the course of action you have to take for example you are uh, computerizing your library now he is telling me the current situation what is the current situation everything is done manually okay your issue of library book is done manually collection of fine is done manually calculation of fine is done manually so when you are doing everything manually they are prone to errors and you may not be able to keep track of the books which has been written the books which has yet to be written all those things would be a problem we call them as pain areas now you should also tell him what is the future situation how should i overcome this problem i want a solution where everything is going to be automated for me so this is what is the requirement given by a librarian so you discover that using open interviews sometimes open interviews could be very complex so in that case uh, you can go for closed interviews in closed interviews what happens you give them a list of questions and ask them to mark the answer and those answers will be a multiple choice question something like you ask a question and there will be four answers to that a b c d you have to the person who is marking the answer would tick any one of the answer one solid example would be you would ask a question how frequently you will generate a report library report and one option would be once in a week once in 15 days once in 3 months or once in a six months or once in a half year so the librarian will take i am going to generate the report say once in three months now that becomes an requirement for you so interviews are good ways of actually understanding the requirement now the next important uh, you know tool what we have in the requirements discovery is called as scenarios scenarios are actually more powerful than requirements because scenarios uh, gives the real life examples and they generally contain a description of a starting situation a description of normal flow of events a description of what can go wrong information about other concurrent activities and a description of state when scenario finishes now this itself tells you the complete details of a requirement now i have a requirement of withdrawing cash now what is the description of a starting situation in atm that the atm should display a welcome message then it should prompt for a uh, insertion of the card that is the starting situation if everything goes correct a description of normal flow of events you know what is the normal flow of events a description of what can go wrong oops if something goes wrong okay then it has to give a error message or information about other concurrent activities and a description of state when scenario finishes when the scenario finishes it should say thank you for using the atm facility it should dispense the cash and it should also print a transaction slip now these are called as scenarios and to express this scenarios we have certain specific diagrams and one such diagram is called as a use case diagram now in a use case diagram we basically express a scenario under requirements discovery now here in use cases there are two things which are of striking importance the first one is called as an actor whom we call as a customer and the second one is called as an action here okay and the third entity which we see here is called as an use case in script now uh, an actor performs an action and the action is documented in the script now in this case a customer is withdrawing money so withdraw money is an action which is performed by an actor called customer now what exactly is that withdraw money is actually written down in a script and this entire model is called as an 
use case. Now this model which describes relationship between use cases and actors is called as an use case diagram and this is a very popular diagram which is actually formulated in a modeling language called UML. UML stands for Unified Modeling Language. Now you can see here I have given a complete uh, uh, use case diagram for the entire system. Now what you can see here in uh, the red is called as a boundary of the system. Now there are two actors here. One is called a student actor and the second one is called as an administrator actor and the system what we are trying to understand here is called as a college registration system. Now student actor has got some actions called student registration. The administrator also is performing this action called student registration. But this action for student is different and this action for administrator is different. For example, student would give his details for student registration and the administrator would perform an action of allocating him a registration number. So registration number cannot be allocated by the student. Now you can see the administrator actor is performing an action called manage examination which cannot be uh, which cannot be in fact interrelated to a student similarly manage question bank is exclusively for administrator but both are using the system that is why both should basically do system login and both will have to actually do an action called test for taking down the test in this case students will basically take the test and our again the student will give the test and the administrator will monitor the test and after the test is being monitored the administrator will give out an report now this will give an interaction happening between in the entire college registration system between actors and action so they are called as scenario based so one good way of uh, the, you know, discovering the requirements are use cases which comes under the scenario based method of requirements discovery. The next one is called as a collaboration uh, diagram which are uh, very important. Now what are collaboration diagram? The collaboration diagram describes how objects interact with each other. Now if you don't know what an object is just forget it at this moment we are going to talk about objects in depth when we are actually doing unit 2 when we actually deep dive into object oriented programming but right now we will give a simple explanation of an object. Now object is a software entity which has got method and variables. Just know that at this particular point of time a method is simply a function and a variable is a variable like what you create in C or C++. Okay. Now, uh, there are four objects which are involved here as you can see. Now you have a lender object, you have a librarian object, you have an assistant object and you have an index object. Now what is a lender object doing? Lender is nothing but a borrower. Now you are a lender because you are basically trying to borrow a book from a library. So you are requesting for a particular book to a librarian by giving him a title. So you say that you want to lend a book on software engineering. Now what the librarian is basically doing, he has to check whether that particular book is available or not. So he is looking into the index. Now in the index, he is actually searching for this particular title called software engineering. So it is shown as, you know, action 2. Now in the index, the index will basically return him the information about that particular title. If that book is available, it will return an information stating that if the book is available. If the book is not available, it will return the information that the book is not available. Now let us say that it returns the information that the book is available. Then the librarian will tell the assistant by giving that particular title to fetch the book. The assistant will go to the re respective rack fetch the book and give it back to the librarian and the librarian in turn will give it back to the lender. So now you can see how the objects are interacting with each other in a given boundary. So we call it as a collaboration diagram. Now what do you mean by collaboration? Collaboration means working together. Okay. Now in this case all the four objects are basically working together in order to achieve a task. And what is that task? ensuring that the book is given to the lender or the borrower. Now we shall see the next diagram called sequence diagram. Now sequence diagram is also scenario based and collaboration diagram is also scenario based. And please remember the scenario based uh, method is for basically performing requirement discovery. Now there are uh, these sequence diagram are used to show how the objects interact over a time. 
Now, in the previous example, collaboration diagram, we just saw how objects interacted, but we did not put a time factor into it. Now, when you talk of a sequence diagram, we also bring in another factor and that factor is called as a time factor. So, the time factor basically tells how objects interact over a given period of time. They are directly related to the collaboration diagram. So, have a look at this uh, particular diagram now. There are the same four objects which we have dealt with the collaboration diagram. You have a lender object, you have a librarian object, you have an index object and you have an assistant object. Now you have a uh, lender who is actually requesting for a book by giving the title to a librarian. Now the librarian after some time, if there is a delay where he looks up to the index. Now that means this index object has to wait till it receives a title from the librarian. So, this is the waiting time. Now, the index will look into that particular uh, uh, index file or it will look into the register. It will take some time for this index object to return the status of the title. And again, the librarian has to, will take some time, this much of time to actually prompt the assistant to get that particular title to the to title and give it to the lender. Now you can see that the assistant object is waiting for this amount of time because he does not have any job till he gets the title. Again the assistant object will take some time to borrow the book and return the book to the librarian and the librarian will take some time to actually uh, give the book to the lender back. So the lender has to wait this much amount of time till he requests for the title and return the book. Now this is called as a sequence diagram. So in sequence diagram we are actually going to put the timing like how much of time it basically takes to collaborate between one object to another object. So again they are scenario based. Now uh, there is a separate uh, science called as ethnography. Now ethnography you know deals with uh, social and organizational factors. Now when you are collecting the uh, requirements you are actually talking to the various uh, stakeholders. The requirements actually depend on the organizational factor and ethnography is a science of observing what is exactly happening in that entire system. I told you that for example you are analyzing a banking system. Now you are analyzing the system where you want to automate the entire banking system. Now you will have to understand how that system is properly working. Now in this case uh, you are now analyzing the token issuing system of a bank. Actually I have worked on this particular project before. So I am giving you the same example. Now what happens in a bank is you now there will be a clerk called as a token clerk. Now you want to withdraw cash. So you will give a check and uh, once the check is given a token will be given to you. The token will be given by an uh, token clerk and the check goes to a process the check will be debited from your account then it goes to a cashier the cashier will call for a token number the moment you give a token to the uh, cashier the cashier will verify the token and he will dispense the cash to you now what this is the normal process or we call it as a formal process but generally now what happens the token clerk will not issue the token even though it is the process says the token clerk only should issue the token the token clerk doesn't issue so he'll call the pun and say now you come and issue the token so the pun is not basically authorized to issue the token but he has to listen to the token clerk because the token clerk is of a superior level as when compared to the pun this is called as the social factor now, this when the when you are actually capturing the requirement, the token clerk may not give this requirement to you. This can only be understood when you actually go and study the entire process in detail. So, studying of human behavior within the organization where there are certain implicit requirements. What these are the implicit requirements which are not being directly portrayed, that study is called as ethnography. Okay. Now, you can see here, ethnography is an observation technique to understand social and organizational requirement. The idea is to identify implicit requirements rather than the formal process. Now, once you have collected the uh, requirements, there is nothing much. You have to bring up the context of a system where it defines the boundaries of the system. Okay. It gives the clear picture of what the system is and what is the system's environment. We have actually seen such a diagram before in my earlier sessions, but I am revisiting that particular diagram. Now you have an auto teller system and these are the various subsystems of the 
auto teller system you may have a security system you have an account database system you have an usage database system now please note that this particular uh, uh, maintenance system here could have subsystems and any of these systems here which are actually connected to the auto teller system could have many subsystems but in a context diagram you don't mention the subsystems you only main, mention the boundaries of the system and you also don't mention what is the interaction happening between a subsystem to the main system so it only gives you the boundary of the entire system now if you want to mention the data flow which is happening between a subsystem to the main system then you have to understand say a model called as a process model and this process model is associated with a data flow now i'll take an i'll take an example of an apartment rental system now this apartment rental system is actually connected to three entities one is called a tenant the second one is called a bank the third one is called an external manager i am using the word entity now how do you define entity an entity is something which has got a physical existence or a conceptual existence now for example tenant you can physically see him physical existence manager you can physically see him physical existence bank you can physically see them physical existence now there could be entity like which are totally conceptual based i have an entity called time can you physically see a time not possible so they are called as conceptual entities okay now let's not touch about uh, conceptual entities now we'll only talk about uh, physical entities now in this case tenant approaches an apartment rental system to basically rent out a house or lease a house now in this case he is going to lease a house now he's going to make some payment now what the system is going to do the system is going to talk to the external manager and he, he is he, the system is going to mention about the consent of lease to the external manager the tenant is going to make some payment the for that particular payment made it has to give the tenant the receipt and it has to actually deposit that payment to bank and finally it has to give the report to the external manager so it's a simple example of uh, apartment rental system a uh, process diagram showing data flows what exactly is happening between the entities of the system and how the data is flowing and what kind of data is actually flowing from one system to or for is one entity to another entity okay now uh, thank you so much for uh, watching this uh, particular uh, video uh, we have almost completed uh, unit 1 of software engineering Uh, do subscribe to our channel SP Tech for more SP SP Tech for more uh, videos and don't forget us to like us on Facebook as uh, uh, well. I will see you soon uh, with another session on software engineering.